And the fact is that one of my PhD students has got a, uh, is sponsored by a company that does software. So I think it's something that you should know. Um, we, when we are discussing about computing, uh, getting the absorbers, calculating the absorbers, which is also the topic of that uh, session, uh, we usually consider the last step of the clinical dosimetry workflow. Basically, for nuclear medicine or internal sources of radiation, you need to know where they are, how many sources, which isotopes, so it gives you how many energy is emitted per decay, and then how that energy disseminates and is eventually absorbed inside the patient. And that, in fact, is the, whoops, I don't know. No, it doesn't really work. Uh, that step here. So, but in fact, when you consider all the steps, they go from the calibration of the imaging systems, acquisition of patient images, quantification, assessment of the activity present in the patient, um, deriving, I mean, segmentation, so uh, being able to define region of interest you want to get the activity uh, from, then registration because images are coming at different time points, so the patient may not be positioned exactly in the same way from one day to the next. Um, then having to, according to the MERD formalism, integrate the time activity curve that will give you the number of decay in the volume of interest. Then you have the absorbed dose calculation. And then, very important, a further step of either um, deriving dosimetry-related indices like radiobiology, BED, or absorbed dose volume histogram, and also at the end presenting the result, which is an essential part and quite often overlooked. All this to say that when we are considering the clinical dosimetry workflow, the absorbed dose calculation itself is only one step. And you are only good if all the steps are addressed uh, correctly and with uh, minimum uncertainty. So, uh, software. So there are software to perform clinical dosimetry in nuclear medicine, and basically we can define them with you know, academic software or commercial software. The commercial software are re relatively new. It's maybe five less than 10 years, and more frequently less than five years. Uh, that table is mine, and it's uh, my current vision, and it's likely to evolve, okay? And these are my personal opinion. Um, the question for academic uh, software is that are they available? Because basically, yes, I don't the best software ever, okay, but I'm not giving it to you. Unless you sign somewhere that you're going, I'm going to be in your publication, that of all your lab and for free generation. So that does not qualify as an available software, in my opinion, okay? Um, then there are commercial software, so these better be available because otherwise the company run out of business, okay? So then are they free? Academic software can be free and are usually free. Not necessarily because the people in the academia are very open people willing to share their toys, but because they do not have a system to charge anyone and to have a system uh, being paid for, right? Um, then commercial systems are absolutely never, never, never free. You know, commercial software, you have to pay. And uh, we'll see later on that there is a huge variation and variability between the software and what they do. But if there is something that is very common to them, is 50,000. So 50,000 is usually the price. It can be in euro, in, uh, it can be in dollar. It doesn't really matter. So no matter the software, it's going to be 50,000. And only because we love you so much. Okay, so you have a special price. Then, is it maintained? That's a big question with academic codes. As we know, I think it's 90% of the code production in a given laboratory is trashed when the student is going away. It can be the PhD student or the postdoc student. So we really have collectively uh, an enormous problem of maintaining the code and uh, everything that's produced in the lab. And it, given the resources that are usually limited, um, not in Germany, obviously, but uh, in France or in all the other countries, it's, uh, it's just a waste to, to, be, to, to trash software that are developed because a student is going. Um, is it maintained for commercial software? It better be. It has to be. We've seen already some software uh, dying, 
I mean, Nostratos, for example, that I'm going to mention in a moment, is no longer available. Uh, but otherwise, if a software is available and can be sold, then it has to be maintained. Documented. I cannot conclude, right? Academic software are usually badly documented because only the, the student who uh, designed it and developed it is able to use it. Um, but for commercial software, it's not necessarily better. Right? You have some kind of documentation, but I dare anyone to uh, use a commercial software if he hasn't received or if she hasn't received a training of some time. Hmm? Then CE mark and FDA approved. That is a crucial thing because if it is not, then it means that we have a research tool. And we can use it, it's no problem. But we cannot use the clinical dosimetry software for routine dosimetry, if that ever exists somewhere. So that's a major advantage of commercial software. They come with CE marking, I mean, for Europe. And it doesn't mean that the software is good, though. It just means that they pass a certain uh, stage uh, examination, and then you can use it. Then after, it's, called, it's like statistical codes, right? Uh, you can always do a t-test, but uh, no one tells you if you have a right to do so, okay? Or, and, or FFT or whatever, right? So it's exactly the same thing. Uh, if, if it's C marked, you can use it, and so you can, make a very, you can give very wrong results, because you misuse the software, but at least you're on the right side of uh, legal uh, aspect. So the question is how to benchmark this code. And in that study from uh, my, my group, um, the student has been comparing different codes. Some of them, like IDAC, are free. Some of them are semi-free, like Olinda. Uh, other are definitely commercial software, so you can buy them. And uh, in order to compare them, it was very difficult, in fact, because this software do not address the same part of a clinical dosimetry workflow. Just to give you an example, Hermes or MIM can do reconstruction. So they can do up to activity, from activity determination to sometimes the absorbed dose calculation. But some, like IDAC, you have to provide all the pharmacokinetic parameters. So it doesn't do reconstruction, it doesn't do uh, segmentation, registration, etc. It has to be said that most of the commercial codes currently available, they do not do reconstruction, but they use reconstructed images with a calibration factor, and they do all the other steps, up to the absorbed dose calculation. <coughs> then, when you want to compare them, so you have to take them as they are, and then you first have to define a common data set to be used for, with a different software. So in that test here, we've been using images coming from GE, and so obviously it was easy to reconstruct with a GE system in blue, dosimetry toolkit to the left part. So the reconstruction was done, and then with uh, GE dosimetry toolkit, we've done all the processing, resampling, registration, segmentation, time activity curve fitting, with only mono exponential, because that was the only possibility at the time, and then using Olinda version one, so no real absorbed dose calculation, but you just input in a code that does a calculation for you. Then for the other platform, so we've been reconstructing images with Hermes HDM uh, because it was very difficult to export reconstructed data from GE. So we had to take the raw projection, reconstruct them, and then we put them in HDM, still Hermes, Stratos, and Planet Dose from Dosisoft. And then, as you can see, the processing is uh, done by the different step, but we, differently, like, you know, mono B exponential for time activity of fitting with uh, Hermes, trapezoid voxel-based for Stratos, uh, multiple option for planet, etc. and calculation can be done. So, in fact, in order to be able to compare the results, you have, in fact, to decide of a common processing. And by doing so, you may be accused of uh, bias because uh, a given manufacturer will say, yes, but you haven't selected that option. That is my option, right? And say, no, I can't because obviously if I want to compare, I have to make sure that these options are available in all the software. So it means that, and I, I'm not supposed to say that, but uh, even that work coming from all group can be criticized because yes, the conclusion is that the results are consistent, not so far, and then by using different software on the same patient data set, you will find results that are not so far away, which is good. On the other hand, we have to bear in mind that we had to make choices 
in order to make sure that we got the results. Otherwise, it would have been impossible. In a further paper, there's a comparison of the different steps. So you can see here DICOM import, export, uh, time activity curve fitting. So all the little icons represent one step in the clinical dosimetry workflow and how it is implemented in various commercially available software. And as you can see, there are differences, okay? So I'm not entering into the detail because otherwise Hans will have a look at me. And uh, so comparing software, you have to see how, you know, reconstruction, if any reconstruction is done, is performed. So here you have uh, some example. How the registration is done, like rigid or elastic deformable registration. How the uh, extrapolation of the time activity curve from zero to the first time point is done. How the extrapolation after the last time point of the time activity curve is done. And eventually how the absorbed dose calculation is done. So you have to consider all these possibilities and at the end of that work, we, we had a wish list uh, because it was so frustrating for the student. So we had fantasies about, you know, this is the software that I would like to get. So I would like my software to have a specific workflow because we're not going to treat or to address clinical dosimetry for iodine 131 treatment of uh, differentiated thyroid cancer as we will do for uh, Lutatera, uh, Lutetium 177 treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. We're not interested in the same organ at risk. We are not interested in the same uh, location for the tumors, etc. So we, we will eventually end up by having, or we need, specific clinical dosimetry workflow. So a processing that will be specific for the disease and for the isotope. Then we need to have import-export features. We don't want to be limited, as was the case with the dosimetry toolkit for the first version. Uh, when you start the process, you have to finish the process. If someone comes in between and say, uh, sorry, me, MD, me, priority, you go out, it means that you just interrupt your process and you've lost everything you've done. Okay? We want to have internal sanity check. That is very little addressed. But whenever you are importing data coming from another department, I would say that half of the time of a physicist is taken just by making sure that the data is correct. So I want to know if the acquisition time is the same for all the time points. I want to know if a collimator that was selected is the same for all the time points. I want to know if the matrix size is the same for all the time points. So I want, and this can be perfectly well integrated in the software with warning flashing in blue, white, red, whenever there's something wrong or something that I should pay attention to. We want to have a modular approach, as was said, you know, that, because that's how it's done. And we want the modules to communicate uh, we want the calibration process to be described. At the moment, it is not. If you compare the different software, some software will ask for a calibration factor that will be in megabecrel per count, or megabecrel uh, per count per second, or count per second per megabecrel. So you, you can have an uh, exquisite mistake by, uh, according to how you input your calibration factor. And in, in a previous IAEA project that just was completed, uh, that was one of the main causes of uh, error and mistake, the way the calibration factor was input in the code. So uh, storing intermediary results, <coughs> output format at least well documented, and uncertainty analysis, that's a fantasy, but uh, it's not here in, in front of this audience that I'm going to teach how you know, assessing the uncertainty is important. So these are all the features that we'd like in a software, but it's not, they are not present these days. Furthermore, um, because the codes are addressing different parts of the clinical dosimetry workflow, we need to define the metric, what it is that we use to compare the codes. Are we happy with comparing average absorbed dose in volume of interest? Or do we want to compare uh, absorbed dose volume histogram? Or do we want to compare absorbed dose gradient on 3D absorbed dose maps? or absorb those rates, right? So defining the metric and the tools that we're going to use to make the comparison is crucial. For example, we can think of using the gamma index as is used in external beam radiotherapy and not used in nuclear medicine. We have to update the standards. I have to remind that there is no DICOM standard specific to nuclear medicine dosimetry. For example, there is no way to store how the fit was done which is crucial. If I'm going back, if I want to pull the data, I really want to know, you know, uh, extract me all the, the 
for example, for the kidney, extract me everything that has a monoexponential decay. <coughs> At the moment, it's not possible because it's just not saved. So we have to think in terms of format. Designing virtual patients to test, and that it really goes in the, the former presentation uh, about you know, all the intercomparison and all the, the tools that we have to set up that can be real tools, phantoms, or digital tools, computing models to, to establish, to do, the, to do the, the comparison. And then, and that's where we start, <coughs> we need to think of a software that allows you to benchmark over software. And that is the relevance for the creation of Open Doors 3D. So what is Open Doors 3D? We started by the um, thinking that well, we have academic and commercial software. Both are interesting for different reasons. But uh, what we wanted to do is not another software. What we want to do is a software that is completely open and completely free. So anyone can access the software. Anyone can access the source of the software. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know if I can have some water. Ah. Thank you so much, otherwise I'm just going to die on the stage, which is <laughs> obviously the objective of every performer, but uh, <coughs> not today, please. Dankeschön, Hans. So, what is Open Dose 3D? It's open source, it's freely available. It's based on 3D Slicer, whom most of you probably are familiar with. And so it can use the feature already included in Slicer, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, and you have to focus on the non-existing feature in the clinical dosimetry workflow that you have to develop to uh, produce a clinical dosimetry software. So Open Dose 3D is a, actually a current 3D Slicer plugin. So I think it's one of the pride of my student that he has been able to pass all the stages of a Slicer evaluation. So it's an official Slicer module that you can download from inside Slicer. And uh, it can use different absorb those algorithms. So Slicer, this is what it looks like for those who do not know. It's a wonderful platform. You can download the software. It's multi-platform. You can visualize. Uh, images, but you can also process them. You can do registration, you can do segmentation, and you can extend it, which is also why it's been selected by my student to develop Open Dose 3D. So this is what it looks like. I'm not saying that it's easy to use. There's a learning curve, and the learning curve is quite steep. But you have a lot of goodies on the internet. You have a lot of YouTube uh, tutorial to teach you step-by-step -step ways of how to use uh, 3D Slicer. Among the really interesting features, you've got DICOM input-output, and it's DICOM RT, right? So it's uh, structures that you can import, export, display, segmentation, and registration. So I'm going to go very quickly through those. Um, registration is using the elastic module, meaning that you can have rigid or non-rigid registration. It's up to you to decide. And basically, if you are not happy with how the registration is made between two time points, it's your problem. You can use all the tools that are built in 3D Slicer. So that my, my student just integrated that in the workflow. But in fact, there's no specific development. It's already there, including uh, AI uh, modules, including you know, all the developers. I mean, people are just providing what they do. It's integrated in 3D Slicer, and then you can use it. So same for segmentation, sorry. So different structure, different customization, you can do basically what you want. You can do a segmentation and propagate the segmentation with a registration at different time point, etc. So the data workflow. So it's very important because I've been discussing two of the steps, but now it's how do you connect them together, right? And it's a lot of work, in fact. So the data workflow was defined in the European project Medirad. Actually, the student was sponsored by Medirad. There's a modular design, so every step is giving a result that can be exported, and you can also import before every step uh, some, uh, some data set. Um, we are, have integrated the calibration module inside the workflow, but it's not available, it's still in the development, I mean, validation phase, I would say. It's developed, it's there, but it's not accessible in the version that you can download. But it means that you have somehow a link to the calibration images, you have a sub-module that allows you to do the calibration on the calibration images, and then internally, the calibration factor is stored and passed to the dosimetry module. 
So it means that there's no longer a source of error to integrate the calibration factor, right? It's also very good because if you change the calibration images because there's been a major change in your gamma camera and nobody told you, which is very strange but can happen, then the software will not find the images and will tell you, you know, where are the calibration images. We have different time variant, time dependent variable integration, different absorb dose calculation algorithm. I'd like to see, to say a little words here about the processing workflow for time index patient image. What is done normally, according to the MERT formalism, eh, is that we perform first the integration of time activity curve to get the so-called cumulated activity or time integrated activity. And then we have one pass of dosimetry to get the absorbed dose. That is a thing from the past for two reasons. Sorry, it goes too quick. Um, it's because in the good old time, it was mostly diagnostic. So we don't care to put all the decay in one box, right? There's no uh, deterministic effect or non-stochastic uh, effect. So we, we just pull the decay. And also it was difficult to make the dosimetry step. So only one dosimetry step was done in the process. What we can do now and what we chose to do in a context of therapy is to do the dosimetry at all the time point to get all the absorbed dose rate because we know that in a context of therapy, the absorbed dose rate is going to matter to characterize the effect. And then we integrate the absorbed dose rate to get the absorbed doses. Okay? So in, we, we, we also have, we therefore have or creating an alternate clinical dosimetry workflow. As you can see here, from activity, we have absorbed those rate calculation, then only segmentation, time integration, and post-processing. It has various implications that I'm willing to discuss during the question uh, session. But we have a two clinical dosimetry workflow in parallel. For the time activity curve fitting, uh, we know that we have two big uh, issues in what happens before the first time point and what happens after the first time point. So this can be addressed differently by the different software. Um, so what I call extrapolation is may not be you know, the, the right term, but we have here a possibility to evaluate in a very easy and smart way the goodness of a fit. For example, the last time point, how much of the activity is remaining? If you still have a lot of activity in the last time point, then it means that your time sampling is not good. Also, you can always, after the fit, compare the extrapolated part of accumulated activity, the array under the curve in a range, with the total array under the curve. And then again, if you realize that 80% of your accumulated activity is actually extrapolated, you know that you are in trouble. These are little things that are built in the software. I mean, it doesn't cost much, but it helps a lot the physicist to assess the goodness of a fit that is selected. Time integration, but it doesn't look really nice. We hope to uh, up update it a little, but you can see that we have several fit function and several ways of handling extrapolations. A selection algorithm for absorbed dose. I'm not going to teach you anything here. Uh, that's very simple. According to the geometry and radiation characteristic, if we have non-penetrating radiation, so we can implement local energy deposition. So we assume that all the emitted energy is absorbed locally, and that's very fast. If it's not the case, then are we in homogeneous medium? If we are, then we can do convolution approaches. Then if we're not, then we have to do Monte Carlo. And in fact, these three modules are implemented in OpenDose 3D. So for local energy deposition, something important to bear in mind is that in that case, we consider only electrons and beta. Because obviously, you cannot consider gamma as uh, locally absorbed. Right? It doesn't make a big difference for lutetium-177 because the yield of uh, gamma is not so high. But for iodine-131, for example, where two-thirds of the energy is emitted as gamma, it really matters. Okay? Then convolution. So to get the volume as, um, voxel S values or uh, voxel dose kernel, we, we have the two acronyms here, uh, we first start with uh, generating dose point kernel, and then after we resample them this time, five minutes. Uh, we resample them to, the, to Voxel to do the convolution uh, in an easy way. Then the last uh, feature is Monte Carlo, and that's great because the code actually generates the input file for gate. So you can run gate with that input file. And the software accepts the output of gate 
as an input so you can then get the absorb those map or absorb those rate map coming from Monte Carlo. Obviously you need to have a big machine to run your Monte Carlo, but yeah, so you, that's why you only do that if you have to. Okay. So open those 3D, specific development, data workflow, time integration with the absorb those rate and time activity curve, we can have both. Uh, and those symmetry algorithm, local energy deposition, convolution, and Monte Carlo if needed. So very quickly, some validation that was made, and it's not validation, it should be verification because it's code versus code. Uh, but here we are in a context of Itrium 90, selective internal radiotherapy, comparing the different algorithm, <coughs> including someone, uh, some algorithm of heterogeneous convolution that we decided not to keep at the end of the evaluation process because it's long and not so precise. So it's worth less, it's better to have Monte Carlo if you are not in a context of homogeneous medium. And you can see that uh, for Itrium 90 at least, the variation between the different algorithm built in open -dose 3D are very small. Here is a comparison of uh, software, so comparison of open -dose 3D versus uh, DOSISoft for uh, lutetium 177 and as you can see for um, no density correction, we are very, very close. And then it's very really interesting that when you implement density correction, we have a big difference with uh, lungs, so left lung and right lung. And that really depends on how you are um, playing with the density that is coming from the Hounds field from the city. So what Open Dose 3D does at the moment, we take the voxel values and we make absolutely no change. But then by asking, we realize that Planet is doing some kind of smoothing, which explains the differences. And with Medirad, we compare for iodine 131, and you are here you can see the different algorithm. I think I'm not going to enter in the detail, but the validation is very, very satisfactory. So the software is available as a module in a Slicer. It is also a GitLab, so it means that everyone, it's an open source project, so everyone wants to develop a specific trend can do it. And uh, we have some internal tests, we have some uh, documentation, and we have some data to uh, train the people. And so as a conclusion, uh, OpenDose 3D allows users to perform personalized internal dosimetry. It is not and will not be FDA or C marked, so it really is a research tool. We intend it as a help to benchmark over clinical dosimetry software. If you see the parallel with external beam radiotherapy, there is no treatment plan that is done on only one software. It's always in parallel with two software. This is our vision of a future for nuclear medicine dosimetry. There are some next steps, integrating calibration, reconstruction, etc., and designing digital tests. I'd like to thank you and just to mention that within the EFOMP, we have created a group of physicists working in uh, nuclear medicine dosimetry. So whoever is interested can join. It's free and uh, it's rather a network of individuals more than a group of experts. So I hope uh, some of you who can be interested can join. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manuel. <laughs> Very interesting presentation, thank you. <laughs> Any questions here in the room? Yes. You get your chance. Yeah, uh, very good talk. Yeah. Just a question regarding this benchmarking of different uh, dosimetry codes. I mean, when, when you mentioned just one link of the whole chain, for instance, taking registration, rigid versus no rigid registration, there's not only one algorithm, there are plenty of parameters. How, how do you deal with this? Yeah, that's, uh, ex thank you very much for the question. In fact, I think that we physicists are guilty to try to solve the problems that we know how to solve. So that's why so many efforts are currently ongoing on the absorbed dose calculation module, which basically is not the main cause of variability of the results. And so if you look at the literature, you've got a lot of uh, publication about, I compare Monte Carlo with convolution, I compare convolution with local energy deposition. And we know, I mean, you, you've seen the algorithm, we know that it's not very, very important. At the other extremity, there's a lot of publication on the quantification of activity, because that you can address with phantoms, even if it's, you know, 3D printed phantoms. But then the question of registration and segmentation, because they are so connect the two of them. I mean, the way you're doing registration is going to impact your segmentation and vice versa. 
So it really is a domain where it's very difficult to have uh, an answer. My personal answer, I mean, it's very quick, is if I'm taking images of patients, because we did that for a project, so I'm taking real images of a real patient acquired at different time points. So the patient will not position exactly in the same way. So it means that I'm not able to say that that voxel is the same, at, of, you know, represent the same volume during the different time point. So somehow I do not have a ground truth, right? Still, I can use that to test not the precision, uh, not the accuracy, but the precision. So I think a way to go is to establish comparison and to see how much it varies. It doesn't say, you know, how accurate you are, but it says a maximum spread that you can expect for a given part of a clinical dosimetry workflow. So that's the way I see it, right? So, Emanuele? Thank you very much. I also found very fascinating your talk. Um, I, I have a question about uh, how, I mean, you can deal with, uh, for example, summing up different dose cubes from different, uh, for example, type of radiations. It's, uh, so, sorry, I don't, get, I don't hear it. I mean, uh, your, your code can handle different uh, load and, and combining, for example, different uh, absorbed dose maps from different type of... Uh, Irradiation. Exactly. So <clears throat> that, is, uh, that is a prerequisite. So we want to be able to export in DICOM-RT yeah. so that at the end you can sum the absorbed dose map. The question is, do you have a right to do it is another question. Uh, like, yeah. you know, can you sum the absorbed doses coming from external beam with internal and isotope? We probably cannot. But we can maybe sum the BED or, you know, the EUBED or, you know, so e including at the voxel level if you're able to do it. Okay, so also... So, be, uh, I mean, in order to compare so different modalities... Can do, yeah. Well, if, if we compare different modalities, then we have to probably consider radiobiology absolutely, more. Absolutely, absolutely. And the second question, if I can, is about the dose rate, which is I found very interesting. So, you have a specific way to account for this because, of course, this, you know, maybe know that there are several definitions now, so can you have some uh, flexibility in these definitions or you have a fixed model for combining the, those rates? Oh, on the know, voxel level, for example. <clears throat> well, what is interesting, and uh, it, but it's a very interesting and complex question. Um, I don't trust, and I'm not the only one, uh, voxel-based quantification of activity. It really is something that is at the moment out of reach because many reasons. Okay. However, I can do absorb dose rate calculation, one pass for my whole data set, so at the voxel level. And then after I define the volume I am interested in. So you see the difference between defining first the volume of interest, then computing inside the volume of interest. That's really nice because you do the absorb dose calculation in one pass, the absorb dose rate calculation in one pass. But as a consequence, in fact, if absorb dose is more or less a smoothing. It means that it's then after easier to integrate in time because you have less voxel that behave strange as compared to activity voxel, right? So it's a win-win situation to, to start with absorb those rate and then integrate. Thank you. We have one more question from the, uh, from the chat. Uh, that's a question uh, from Michael Wemenchev. Uh, for the code JavaScript void uh, registration segmentation, what is better, PMOD or 3D slicer? I've got no idea. <laughs> it's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> I hope someone smarter can answer. Um, no, more seriously, I think that what is good in, in slicer is that you've got a variety of possibilities. Then what is bad in Slicer is that you've got a variety of possibility and you have to test them. You know, so uh, you, you can't have it all, right? Uh, if you have only one possibility, people are complaining because they don't have the possibility, etc. If you have a variety like in Slicer, it's not open doors, right? It's inside open doors, but it's a Slicer module. Um, you've got so many possibilities. So it's ex exciting, but it means that you have to spend some time to, to answer that kind of question. 
Okay, thank you very much, Manuel, again. And then we move to you, Emanuele Schifoni from TIFPA, who will talk about new developments in radiotherapy treatment applied to particle beams. Okay, so good morning to everybody. I have to keep the time because I'm also scared by the German chairman. Typically, Italians are more relaxed. <laughs> I will try to be in time. Okay, 43. Um, so I will um, go a bit further on this uh, clinical application, I mean, still on the very research level. Uh, and uh, it's starting. Subtract these minutes, huh? <laughs> okay, so I keep talking in the meantime. Uh, so I will present a bit of the state of the art. No, sorry, this is not my talk, sorry. Okay, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I will present a bit of an overview of what uh, are the state of the art of research in uh, treatment planning for particles. And since I think it's most relevant for uh, dosimetry at different levels, different scales, I was uh, thinking to focus on the biological treatment planning. So what I will do, I will make an, a very short overview of what is uh, in, the, in the field about uh, biological treatment planning for particle beams and, what, and some example of latest advantages, advan advancements. There are several ones on course in the latest years. I will focus on a few ones which I thought could be relevant for this community. So multiple ions treatment planning, NTCP-based planning, which is basically planning to keep into account for the effect on the normal tissue, and the outlook of the big topic of the moment in radiotherapy, which is flash, so how we can plan particles account for the flash effect. So uh, bas basically, what are the definitions of uh, biological treatment planning? Be well, it's for ion beams, since we have a lot of uh, degrees of freedom of uh, also biological effectiveness, we want to account for them in, in planning as much as possible. And of course, we can do a simple recalculation, so we can have a plan which we neglect about the biological effect, but we can also inverse plan, which means that we can already use this information for getting the optimal plan in these conditions. Uh, it's important, it's fundamental, for example, you want to, want, want to assess for different benefits of different radiation types. Now we have a lot of disposal of different particle types, comparison with photons and with different particles. And uh, also it's important that we need additional physics sometimes because we need to develop uh, some, some um, efficiency that take into account of the effect of different particles. Uh, one important factor that is always to keep into account in this type of biological treatment planning is the so-called those modifying factor, which is basically a ratio. I mean, we have seen several of them. The most famous one is the RB, which is basically a ratio of those at same condi same effect of uh, uh, biological effectiveness, but uh, uh, is in general can be generalized as a ratio of those in a special condition uh, divided by the, the dose in a standard condition. And this can be, for example, accounted for the oxygenation, like uh, the OER, or the uh, uh, amount of radio sensitizers, or several others which you will see uh, during the talk. Uh, of course, there are a, often a complex uh, dependency of that, and uh, can be dependent of, of the LT, on the concentration, and on several other um, uh, type of, of, uh, of effects. But what is important is we can always quantify this and as a ratio of effectiveness, and then we can import this in our planning and keep in account of that for getting an effective dose. Uh, so what's the optimization problem? Just a, a small mention of what is the basics of the optimization for getting inverse planning uh, calculation. So we have basically uh, to find a vector of optical particle numbers. 
Ah, I can see here. <laughs> so, uh, for example, this is the typical raster scanning method which we have in, uh, for example, GSI. We had GSI was there before, uh, where we can basically have uh, a different irradiation, different slides, which are defined by different energies and steered by uh, magnetic fields. So we can have spot at each position, and the, the task is to optimize this spot according as much as possible from the information that you have and the effect that you want to have in the tumor. So this is the basic uh, function. Basically, you want to um, reduce, uh, to minimize this, uh, this, this, this objective function, which is the difference of the dose uh, that you get at each point and the prescribed one, and also a, a, a difference of the dose in the organ at risk, which should be weighted by an heavy side function in order to get uh, to, to get the threshold dose that you don't want to exceed in the organ risk. This is the basic quantity that is part of every uh, treatment planning uh, um, that you are accounted for. And you want to get this minimum, which is al always not very easy, especially when you have some additional effect like the biological left, like RB and others, that you want to minimize and introduce a strong nonlinearity in your in your uh, problem. And of course, depend on the specific dose modifying factor as the ones that I introduced, RB, OER, or whatever, that you introduce in your, in, your, in your code. These are a few codes that are dealing with particles. I here restrict only to those having more than, uh, beyond the protons, because with protons would be a, a much larger uh, list. And uh, there are some analytical based, like TRIP98, uh, which is, was the first one and the one that I contributed to the develop. Then MATLAB, which is an open source one based on, 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 on MATLAB. FROG uh, of the HIT and uh, other ones for, of ENFN. Uh, Monte Carlo, of course, there are also some GPU based. It was nice, the introduction of the previous speaker. Uh, Fred, which is, was developed in Rome, Fluca, and Topas also allow uh, some treatment planning tools. Uh, and RayStation, which is a commercial one. There are, of course, other ones. Uh, just a brief mention to other ideas to uh, keep in account to this. Uh, biological effect in treatment planning, recently was introduced the idea to use nanodosimetric quantities at the optimizing quantity. The first uh, paper was uh, uh, made in this, um, in this journal by, uh, by uh, uh, Rainer Schulte, and, uh, and recently it was revived by the work of the Topaz group. And here you see, for example, the mapping of uh, a nanodosimetric quantity in a, in a tumor, which is the um, uh, cumulative probability of having more than some uh, the, the given number of ionization, and recently was reviewed by this uh, paper of Antonio Ruszynski. Uh, to keep account in inverse planning of different uh, dose modifying factors, we recently introduced uh, the kill painting approach. When you uh, start from the absorbed dose, which is the basic quantity which everybody knows, and then you typically have uh, several steps of increasing the biological complexity that you keep in account. One of that is, of course, RB weighted dose, which is now basically uniformly accepted, especially for particles larger than protons. But if you consider also the intratumor uh, probability, you have some additional degrees of freedom on you to want to keep in account. And then you can introduce another those modifying factor, for example, the oxygen enhancement ratio, and then you get a, a, another quantity, another matrix, which could be the biological ISO effective dose in the local microenvironment. So you basically OER weight the effort. So this uh, tell, uh, allow you with the flexibility that you have with the treatment planning with particles, which basically you can change point, point by point, energy by energy, the particle numbers, to change your uh, your optimization uh, profile and getting the effect that you want in the target and, of course, in the, in the organ at risk. This was the basis of a project which was recently concluded at uh, ANFN, co in combining different other institutes, which is Move It, Modeling and Verification for Ion Beam Treatment Planning. And uh, the be basic is just to put together as much as possible the ingredients that we have from the physics, uh, mm, let's say, large-scale physics, which is the dose distribution, nuclear fragment spectra, stopping power data, but also another type of physics, which is radiobiology, we, where we account not only from the 
biological description, but also from microscopic and nanoscopic physics, which is the nanodosimetry, microdosimetry based information, like sample MKM, LEM, and other uh, codes that tell us the relative effectiveness. Having all these ingredients together in treatment planning, considering the bin line specifics and the patient imaging data, we can get to uh, effective dose profiles and we can verify, compare, for example, different modalities and we can get uh, different uh, um, verification with different tools, for example, uh, hypoxic chamber where we can really uh, reproduce uh, cell survival data in, uh, in, uh, in epoxy condition. But the important point is also to get to the clinical impact, which means the translation to some quantity which is affecting the response, which is, for example, TCP and NTCP. Okay, one example of accounting for the, for the fragments was recently published, like in this paper, when we saw that proton plants, when you account for, for fragments, produced in the entrance channel especially, you have a different effectiveness which can be quantified, not huge, but on the level of five to eight percent. And this will improve the comparison with the um, data of, uh, with the radiobiological data. Uh, another point could be the, to assess what's the best ion. I mean, now we have several ions. Heidelberg can shoot four different ions. Also in Japan, they can use different ions. What means the best? Of course, we have, uh, it's a multidimensional problem because we have a, a different cost, a different RB, a different uh, dose conformality uh, advantage. So, of course, there is uh, probably not unique choice, so you have to, uh, uh, to consider different uh, cases, patient-based cases, in order to assess this. In order to do this type of evaluation, you need treatment planning tool which account for all these efforts in order to make a fair comparison. This is an example we published some years ago where we basically look to different ions, helium, carbon, and, uh, um, and oxygen in, uh, in, uh, in uh, shooting uh, plants with different uh, size of the hypoxic area. And we see that uh, there is no unique uh, results because different uh, regions of, of hypoxic area, of course, respond to a different, better preferred ions, and also uh, the different uh, level of hypoxic uh, content will affect which is the preferred ions, which are basically indicated by this different line in the, in, in the plot. Uh, another important application is uh, uh, the possibility to combine different ions. Of course, it's the, the, the immediate uh, next application to think, okay, we have, uh, we have several, uh, several ions, so why we don't combine them? And, and combining them could be extremely powerful in some cases, like this one, which we published a couple, uh, three years ago, which was basically the combination of helium and oxygen in a plan in order to concentrate the, not only the biological effectiveness, but the uh, dose average LET in the center of the, of the target where the more hypoxic area is considered to play a larger role. And then in this way, one can get an optimal plan. Of course, this is not not unique, and you, can, you have to consider the morphology of the plan. You have to import your plan and make careful assessment. This is not always the same case. But what is interesting is that you can get an optimal solution where the combination of the two plans is better than the choice of a single one of a different type. And this was done also by other groups, like the Inaniva group in, in Japan and the Mairani group in HIT, and we recently submitted a, a, a review on this type of application of multiple ions, which is becoming quite uh, state-of-the-art because in Japan they are, now they are able to switch between different ions in uh, different in small water. Okay. Uh, another multiple level optimization was recently done by my NFN colleague uh, Andrea Tilly with uh, Ara Parganetti, and the idea was to combine different fractions. So use uh, different plants uh, deviating from the standard plan where everything is conformal at every fraction, but to use these additional degrees of freedom but when you basically have different time fraction to irradiate a patient and use a combination of different fractions to get 
uh, the most uh, the most advantageous irradiation profile. And this you can see that get some in, in some case some improvement uh, according to for these are two patient example, this green line uh, uh, as, uh, as compared to the hypofractionation regime and the, the normal, the standard fractionation. So you can use this degrees of freedom conveniently having this additional effect. What about volume effect? So this is another level of biology because uh, as was briefly mentioned by uh, one of the speakers before, this is a typical optimization which we have. Oh, sorry, I'm talking too loud. <laughs> Uh, your optimization basically update the, the physical beam um, uh, accounting for biological effect, accounting for the physics and biology data, and uh, uh, produce this data. But then you have an additional information, which are volume effect parameters. We know that different organs, especially from the normal tissue, respond in a different way as far as uh, in the organ responds. And what is the volume effect? Well, uh, this depends on the organ, uh, which can be the, the composing different functional units uh, with different structure, can be serial, with small volume effect, with the, where the most important uh, effect of the probability of complication correlates with the maximum dose, and parallel, where actually the volume effect is larger and the mean dose is having a larger uh, role. So a way to account for this, of course, is the generalized uh, equivalent uniform dose. And you can input this, uh, which gets this metric inside, which to, uh, use this uh, parameter A, which takes into account how much large is the volume effect. And uh, of course, this is strongly related to the NTCP. This is the reason why it's so important. And we can directly connect the NTCP to this. And uh, the point is that, uh, of course, this is a, according to different parameterization, but it's a direct the minimization of this term is more direct than the minimization of the voxel-based dose. And so new optimization approach for particles is to account also for this GUD, which is now more complex because this is always depending on the RB at the same time and all the other the biological effectiveness. So it's a strongly nonlinear effect, which is inside this GUD term, which is now taking into account of the effect on the organ based. And of course, uh, you have now this quantity, which is uh, weighting the RB. And what you do, basically, you you push your optimization to a different level of coverage of your organ. So not only on the maximum dose, of, but of different sides of your DVH histogram. So the results, of course, are much uh, affecting. The, for example, these are a parotis plan. And you see very clearly that from the voxel-based approach, also with particles, you get a very strong reduction when you use a GUD-based optimization approach. Uh, so uh, also in the term of normal tissue complication probability, this is uh, uh, clearly having an impact because you start from a level of uh, your complication probability in the parodides and you go down to uh, a much lower complication probability. So it's really having an important effect in the results. Another application of biological effectiveness in the target is accounting for the uh, risk of modeling of secondary cancers. This is also very strongly related to the uh, Eurodose activities, let's say. So that's why I wanted to mention this. And there are a lot of uh, dosimetric studies uh, um, in, 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 in according to that uh, to explore, for example, with different particle types and different uh, radiation, different modalities, how we can minimize, if we plug this to a treatment planning, the uh, effectiveness on the level of, um, of a second cancer induction. Of course, from the dosimetric uh, level, is quite uh, obvious because you typically have, uh, for example, in this, in, this, uh, in this paper we published uh, a couple of years ago, there is uh, the a very clear dosimetric advantage in, in this breast irradiation to reduce strongly the dose. And then if you blindly apply 
a model to that you get uh, a, an information of a strongly reduced risk uh, from the proton as compared to the X-rays. But then one want to keep in account also of the biological effectiveness of this particle, then one has to develop models. And we recently developed a model based on a MKM extended to account not only for the cell killing, but for the mutation induction as an, as an alias of uh, uh, promotion to uh, cancerous cells. Another approach was done very, uh, uh, very recently by the group of Thomas Friedrich, which very nicely tried to uh, im implement in the local effect model the probability of tumor, tumor induction and then apply this to treatment planning studies. And you see that it's not obvious anymore the comparison, for example, between proton and carbon. You can see here, for example, that the, uh, the risk of proton as compared to the risk of carbon is not always in a, in a monotonic way, but for different organs, uh, the risk of carbon becomes, can become, according to this model, larger than in the case of proton. So it's not a unifo uh, uh, univoc way to assess this. So you really need this effectiveness assessment, not only dosimetric assessment, to keep on account really the, uh, the effectiveness. Last point, which I want to mention today, is according to um, the ultra high dose rate uh, irradiation, which is now the big hot topic in the radiobiology community, and of course affect a lot of the planning, with the, especially with, the, uh, with uh, electron beam, proton beam, but also re very recently with carbon and helium beams. So um, how this work? Of course, this is very known, uh, the, the left part of the dependent of the rate, where maybe here the, the major expertise is focused. It's very well known that uh, this part, uh, we have a, a dependence. Again, we have another dose modifying factor, which is basically related by the dose rate. So the dose rate, the, the, the ratio of doses is giving the same effect for a standard dose rate as comp uh, uh, with a fraction of the dose rate specific which we are going to, to look. And that very low dose rate is very well known and it is very clearly having a, 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 an announcement. And this is also clear to understand and also elegantly explained by several models. For example, this is LPL model where you can get a, 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 a potentially lethal damage and you can very clearly mechanistically explain it. What is not clear is what happened at very high dose rate, where it seems to appear a strong evidence of a dose uh, modifying factor which goes up again, but not, all, not uh, for everything, but just for the normal tissue. And this is, we, is presently not understood very well, not clearly described, despite a lot of accumulated evidence. Of course, there are then several basic questions related to that, why this happens, of course, how is possible to justify that is inverse, protective, with increased dose rate, how is possible to justify having just for the NT and not for the tumor, and when, for which radiation parameters this happens, which allow people to exploit this, but finally, how can we optimize this? Can we get this dose modifying factor, which is another one, like RB, like OER, inside a treatment plan and perform optimization, a flash optimization with particles. Of course, this is a big challenge now. And uh, why? Because, of course, this affects a lot of, uh, of spatiotemporal scale, as this uh, picture uh, is showing, because, of course, flash occurs in a very strong, uh, strongly different uh, time frame as compared to the typical time to deliver a given amount of dose. It was very clear that a given amount of dose should be given. And, uh, and for different particle type, you have different uh, maximum range of validity for getting this effect. So it's very clear that a, a huge amount of research is needed to characterize this, but I will not mention about that now. I just want to focus about the planning, of course, this is, uh, which is this, uh, in this uh, new uh, ENFN pro uh, project, the, basically the part four, where uh, um, it's possible to get in some consideration this effect and perform planning studies. So how one can do this? Well, for particle, there is a secret to, there is a secret tool that one has to use, which are range modulators, because otherwise you cannot cope with the time, at least at the present time, 
with the time for changing energy. So you cannot anymore do completely active scanning because the time for changing an energy is way too long for allowing this effort to be maintained. So you have to change completely. So this nice flexibility is a bit affected that we had before because we only can use some tricks. And the tricks is, for example, to use a partially passive device like this one, where you start with a mono-energetic field and then you spread the beam according to the shape that you want. And you use this modulator to, affect, to, to spread this, this beam according with different pins that again are optimized in order to get exactly this level of optimization. These are also what was in development in Trento, uh, combining some uh, Topaz uh, calculation and, um, and uh, uh, ray uh, station plants produced by uh, the Tetraplanet. It's finished? Ah, five minutes. Oh, wonderful. Well, okay, okay, wonderful. Okay, then uh, this is basically the, 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 the scheme, uh, but I, I will conclude. Uh, so one has to start with the static optimized plan, then one has to take into account to the temporal delivery information. That's why the dose rate now plays again a big role because typically radiotherapy, external radiotherapy, the dose rate was not very interesting, but now it's becoming interesting again. Uh, you need the time for delivering a, a given spot of radiation, the time for scanning, because still you have the scanning. And then you can feed your dose modifying factor, which takes account of several multidimensional dependencies. Dose, dose rate, oxygenation, because of course it's been seen that also the oxygenation plays an important role in that LET clearly, because LET also has a spatial temporal different deposition as it's clear from all the structural codes. And then you can feed everything in a dose and dose rate optimization because you want to get a given dose, a given dose rate, and of course you uh, can get this to, to produce a flash optimized plan. And another important complication here is the dose rate scoring, because then it is not trivial how to score the dose rate. So the point is that you have the tumor, you have your different spots, and uh, the idea is that you combine this dose in a different way, but at the voxel level, you have a different uh, contribution of the different uh, spots that are playing. So the overall dose rate is not the best way to uh, account for that. So you maybe have to use in a different quantities which account for that, which can be, for example, a threshold of, of uh, spots contributing to that voxels. And you, you see that this leads to different definition of those rate, which is not what, uh, which is basically the crucial point, which is now part of the investigation. I conclude, so biology and treatment planning include as much as possible information for physics and biology to make an inverse treatment plan, so to, to reproduce the plan that you want using all the flexibility that you have uh, uh, using your particle beams. And uh, there are a lot of the direction now that you are expanding in this way. Of course, you have to describe different dose modifying factors, and you have to combine scales, but uh, it's also important to keep into account the dose delivery time structure in detail. I thank you very much for your attention. Right time. Thank you very much, Emanuele. It was a really interesting view in what's going on here in that field. <laughs> Great. So, are there any questions in the audience? Okay, everyone is hungry already. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have one online, they are not hungry. <laughs> oh, they are the different uh, time, time, time scale. <laughs> The question is, is from Mikhail Rumenchev. Uh, which RBE value are you normally using for helium ions? Sorry, which? which RBE, RBE value? values. RBE values? Yes, for helium okay. ions. Okay, so there are uh, plenty of different models that you can account. I mean, for TRIP, which is the one which I'm mostly involved in developing, we use the LAM4, which is uh, basically one of the state of the art code. And, uh, for other uh, codes uh, where I am contributing is uh, for Air Planet, for example, which is the NFN code, we use MKM, uh, 
uh, and we are recently developing a new model based on um, on microdosimetry, which is uh, the GSM two. Okay, actually, the qu oops. the question was. Which RBE value are you using for helium ions? Ah, sorry, what? for part, sorry. sorry. Ah, for helium ions, yes, of course, it's explicitly computed by the, it's explicitly computed. I mean, uh, there are several approaches for, for the helium ions. There are, for example, the Mairani approach, which is a, a, a data-driven approach, or there are, of course, some other uh, methods, approximated approach, which are, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in NIRTS, they use also but uh, what we are using is uh, is uh, is a full calculation with the with the lamb okay so the answer is not as simple as the question was posed <laughs> well yeah yeah oh, yeah i, I, yeah. I mean uh, the colleague who was yeah, asking yeah i mean no 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 it, it, yeah, it was okay. a very it's a good yeah. question i mean <laughs> helium is now basically uh, while it's very clear that for proton everybody still skip the 1.1 because we know that it's false, but we are scared to move from the 1.1, it's clear. Carbon is clear that we cannot use a fixed value. We have to use the complete uh, calculation. We take into account uh, amorphous track models or, or uh, other models that take into account the fact that it's different from, <laughs> from, uh, from one or, or from a fixed factor. Helium is now an emerging particle, which is now a, a few months ago went to the clinic for the first time. I mean, which is a big news because in Hyderabad they treated the first patient a few months ago. Uh, so the, pro the problem is that which type of uh, conservative or less conservative choice we are, uh, we are using for that. And it's a ve very good question. I mean, wh what they did, for example, in Hyderabad, they tried to get in a kind of um, uh, compromise solution, which is a data-driven data approach. Uh, in our case, since we are not scared to treat patients, we are just playing with uh, different planning studies, we use the full calculation accounting exactly like carbon. So with the, the specific RBE that comes from a full calculation of different uh, particle types. And the RBE will be something on the order of two, probably. Well, it's different in every yeah, in yeah, every sure, point. Yeah, in sure. every point, yes, yeah. it's on the level of two. I mean, it's ranging from one point five to three in some regions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, any more questions here in the audience? No. Okay, then thank you very much, Emanuele. So this closes the second session. And we are starting at half past one. And we are, we are now having the lunch break, uh, which is actually quite generous, so we obviously expected more delays. So we start again at 2.30. So enjoy your lunch and see you here. <laughs>